This is the BBC. Welcome to Comedy of the Week with me, Carrie Ad Lloyd. Is it your first time here? Then hello, freshers! Grab your ID card, pop it in a lanyard and make sure you've unpacked all your insecurities before you head down to the Student Union because this week's show is all about the best years of your life or at least some of the most expensive considering the contact time you have. It's university! This week's Comedy of the Week is Liam Williams' Ladhood. Liam's back for a second series and this time round he's delved into the emotional back catalogue of his university years when he was surrounded by Tweed, punts, and future cabinet members at the University of Cambridge. And we are privileged to have Liam with us today to introduce the show and if you hang around afterwards we'll be asking him more questions as well and he'll be answering them in what we can only describe as an interview. Liam, hello. Hi, Gary. Um, Liam, it's obviously based on real life situations. Um... How much, basically, how much is made up? <laughs> yeah, I, I was thinking about this the other day for a, a different interview. It's something people are intrigued yeah. to ask. Yeah. And I sort of facetiously said it's about 63% real, which is obviously a ridiculously specific number. <laughs> but I think that's like it's mostly based on real things that happened to me. Yeah. But then that would actually be to just tell them verbatim would be boring or yeah. not, um, or unethical on right. some of the people involved. So they're kind of real stories from my life that are changed to become comedic. Well, you are an extremely brilliant writer, and this is reflected by some of the very real language in the show. Would you mind just warning listeners about how real some of the language gets? Listeners, a warning to you, the language is filthy. <laughs> it's the language of the, the docks, the language of the gutter, um, I mean, mm. There are a few swear words in there. And also there is uh, an incident recollected which involves racist language, but it's not a racist show. I, <laughs> yeah, it's for not. one, think yeah. racism is bad, but one of the characters in the show maybe does not. Yes. So there is racist language, but it's not racist sentiment. Well, as I said, I'll be talking to Liam after the programme, but until then, please enjoy the wonderfully charming Ladhood. When I was a lad, corduroy pictures, when I was a lad, Saturday Hello, I'm Liam Williams, and I am, for better or worse, largely for worse, a lad. And these days, a critically lauded but commercially unsuccessful comedian. In series one of this programme, I recounted my mid-adolescence. In this series, I will recall stories from about three to five years later, when I was, despite my best efforts to the contrary, older, and not much wiser, and still without a fully developed prefrontal cortex. You see, almost exactly 10 years ago, at the age of 18, I went to university. Could there be a better way to make sense of the changes that have occurred in this country over the last decade than by hearing the first-hand story of an ordinary, lower-middle-class state school boy from Leeds who made it to the University of Cambridge? Uh, well, yes, you could do a documentary about, actually, disadvantaged people in Middlesbrough or somewhere. But now, let me take you back to Leeds, the summer of 2006, when smoking was still legal in pubs, David Beckham was still England captain, and the volume of Arctic sea ice in June still measured over 15,000 kilometres cubed. Saturday night, Leeds City Centre, July. It's freakishly warm and everybody's loving it. The economy's stable and that's never going to change. We're going out, me and the boys, using incorrect grammar. Me, Cranny and Ralph. Tonight we're going to have it. Get battered. Pissed. blind Pissed. You already said that, Cranny. This is Leeds, where the men are hard and the women are also hard. This is the big one, the all-timer, the best night of our lives. All right, it's going to be shit. It's going to be another shit night in Leeds. It always starts strongly enough. At 8pm you're in a taxi with hope in your heart and 50 quid in your wallet. But by 4am you're in a taxi with nothing in your heart and 10, 10 to 15 quid left in your wallet. Because this is the north and it's still 2006 so drinks are a bit cheaper. Another shit night though. Cranny and me in the back of a taxi and in the front half asleep Ralph, our mate. But one of those mates that you don't actually like. 
Where to then, lads? Garforth, please, mate. Ah, oh, Garforth, a relatively prosperous, mostly white suburb where traditional working class and professional lower middle class communities coexist easily enough. Not the most affluent area of the city, but by no means deprived. What are you saying all that for, mate? Well, I just thought if you make this into a radio show at some point, you can just pop in what I've said verbatim and it'll get some key info across. Ah, very considerate, driver. I really thought I were going to pull that blonde bird tonight. You never pull, Cranny, because you're a silly, ugly bastard. I'm sick of this place. Yeah, me too. It's all right for you. You're off to Oxford in September. Cambridge. Whatever. Well, I doubt it anyway. I'm going to get the grades. I've got to get three A's. Do you know what you're going to do next year? Well, I did this questionnaire on computer in school careers office, and they told me the best job for me is golf greenkeeper. So I'll probably just do that. Right. I guess I never saw me saying doing that, but... If that's what the career software says is best for me, then I'll have to do it. You should be a taxi driver, mate. Yeah? Yeah, that's what I did. Is it? Yeah. Oh, nice one. Just drop us here, please, mate. Words can't convey the bored frustration of the next few weeks as I waited for results day. Only this seven-second-long recording of a crying child can. I lived with my parents and younger sister, who were all perfectly decent people, but housing an 18-year-old boy full of new hormones and aspirations towards poetry and hedonism in a modest three-bed semi-detached suburban family home is like housing a frog in a bag of wet sand. Survivable, but not ideal. Finally, results day came. Outside the entranceway, three blonde girls were suspended in mid-air. In the library, hundreds of white envelopes were laid out on tables, each containing a different fate, a recipe for a life. If I were a physics student, I might consider how the envelope I held in my hand were like Schrodinger's envelope, permitting me at once to have both gotten and not gotten into Cambridge. But I wasn't. I was an English student, and thus the sort of person who lazily uses Schrodinger's cat metaphors to describe states of uncertainty. I needed three A's. I opened the envelope. There they were. English language, A. English literature, A. History, A. B for that one, unfortunately. I'd messed up. Life ruined. How'd you do, love? Two A's and a B. Uh, Oh, love, that's brilliant. You've worked really hard. And, And Leicester is a fantastic university. All of which was true, and my mum definitely said the right thing in the moment. It was just a shame that she had spent the previous 18 years instilling in me a dangerous amount of paranoia over social and economic status and indoctrinating me with the belief that academic success was the only means by which one could transcend one's circumstances and by extension achieve, if not happiness, then at least some liberty from sadness and fear. When we got home, Dad was waiting by the door. A letter came for you. It's got a Cambridge University stamp on. Well, it'll just be confirming I didn't get in. But what if it says, even though you didn't get your grades, they're going to admit you? Of course I ain't going to say that. Give it here. Dear Mr Williams, even though you didn't get your grades, we're going to admit you. I thought that's what it might say. Oh, thank God for that! They decided to admit me anyway, whether to fill some kind of quota for state school kids or as a result of an admin error or because they took a shining to me in my interview. They had stooped to let a student without straight A's into the country's most prestigious university. Fuck you, Lester, with your friendly and diverse student community and your excellent teaching and your highly competitive employment prospects. I would be joining the ranks of the self-important. Oh, look, a waitrose. We were driving into Cambridge now. It's a different world here, Liam. And she was, in figurative and slightly hyperbolic terms that have been vindicated by the general political narrative of the last few years, pretty much correct. Soon we left behind the suburbs and entered the herbs, where the medieval colleges with their vaulting fans and flying buttresses and fluted columns inscribed a language of money into the sky. The city has too many green spaces and seems almost to flaunt them as a gangster rapper might flaunt his hundred dollar bills. The young bodies of students, sexy geeks all, adorned these leisure pastures as in some massive, modern pastiche of le déjeuner sur l'herbe. We were heading to Hailston College, which would be my home for the next three years, 
Hailston is a name I've made up to buy me a bit of artistic license, but probably not artistic license enough to avoid a libel case if they, i.e. the college IRL, really want to bring one. Back in the car. So it should be just up here, on the right. Past the botanical gardens. Oh, it's a different world. It's a different world! If she'd said it three times, it wouldn't have felt excessive. To go with the big new buildings, there was a big new car park, wherein it made me very nervous to see dozens of other kids with their parents taking boxes out of boots. Because they all looked like they knew what they were doing, how to carry themselves, what to wear. Gilets, loafers, rugby shirts, chinos here, tight indie band t-shirts and skinny jeans there. In my Ben Sherman polo and bootcut jeans, I felt like a real fish who is not in the water where it loves to be. I felt like a Saturday afternoon lager drinker who ducked into a branch of browns for a piss and was attracting stares. Most didn't even appear agonizingly embarrassed to be with their parents and seemed actually to be smiling and talking to them as if they saw them as fellow adults and not as largely benign but often perturbed and perturbing elders whose legal duty it was to shepherd them safely towards adulthood. We ventured to my allotted room. Room 348, just like every other room in the building I'd soon enough discover, was, in terms of size and decor, somewhere between a cabin on a cheap channel ferry and a travel lodge. NB, such modern accommodation, was quite rare in the city, and for students at the older colleges, it was like living in one of the more boring Jeeves and Worcester stories. Oh, it's like a different world in here. What followed was a two-hour unpacking session slash crash course in the basic skills of adulthood from my mother, who presumably thought that cramming them in now would somehow redeem my essentially still juvenile personhood, like a panicked chef trying to redeem a bad meal by frantically pouring loads of salt on it. Now, eat properly. And get lots of sleep. And don't drink too much. And please, don't die. And have a good time. And learn a lot. But please don't change fundamentally as a person. No, and, and don't, don't forget, forget about, about us. us. I won't. My overlong adolescent self-consciousness wasn't enough to stop me getting a bit teary as I bade them goodbye in the car park. I returned to 348, leaving the door open so as to seem welcoming to other students, as all my freshers' survival guide leaflets had instructed me to do. And I inspected my domain. I had bought posters to match the personality I decided I now had, one of Bob Marley playing football and one of a semi-naked woman, which was not objectifying because it was in black and white. Now what? This was the beginning of everything. I was in the holding pen of my adulthood and I'd never felt so neutral. An empty notepad, an unfilled glass, a bare plate were all things that had been left out from the unpacking. So I tidied them away and then pondered how this was a fresh start in my life. Hi there. There was a very posh girl at my door. She was eminently fanciable in a sort of Jack Wills meets the pre-Raphaelites in a branch of Jack Wills kind of way. All right. I'm Portia. Liam. Great to meet you. Can I come in? Yeah. Cool room. Uh, thanks. Is yours different from this? No, it's the same. They're all the same. Who's that woman? I uh, don't know. Just a woman. Right. Very stylish. And who's that? That's Bob Marley playing football. Ah, do you like Bob Marley? A bit. Do you like football? A bit. I don't know much about either, <laughs> but I guess that's what we're here for, discovering new things. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to the squash later? The, the what? What's that? A squash, it turned out, is a kind of informal gathering. The word was used a lot at Cambridge, along with many other unfamiliar words, such as buttery, meaning canteen, bop, meaning disco, and croddle, meaning a kind of splendid horse, allowed to wander the college wielding executive academic powers. NB, there has never, ever been one croddle in Cambridge. Eight o'clock in the bar. Right. Sounds good. Brillo pads. Shit's up. What? Nothing, just... Uh, cool. See, see you there. <laughs> right then, I knew it was her. My future wife, Portia Barnes. I'd heard tales of people meeting live partners at university, but I never imagined it could happen so quickly that the very first person who stepped through my open door would be my wife. In another woman that can take your spot, my... Hey, where are you from? Uh, Leeds. <laughs> oh, dear! <laughs> of course, that's not really what he said, but it's what I heard. What he really said was, 
Great city. I saw Portia, and she waved at me, uh, but she was talking to a guy who looked like he might not understand why shooting birds for sports is wrong, so I was scared to talk to her. In a bid to seem refined, I was wearing my polo shirt with the least writing on it, and I didn't even pop the collar. But I was still finding my first squash difficult, and the people somewhat intimidating. Hi, I'm Hugo. Hi, I'm Pandora. Hi, hey, I'm also Pandora. Hi, I'm Belinda. Hi, I'm Mike. Not everybody had posh names, admittedly. Did you do a gap year? I went to Goa, and then I went to Borneo, and then I can't remember where I went, but it was still... I volunteered on my gap year. Six months yeah. in Patagonia? Fingered her up Machu Picchu. Just smoking the most beautiful hat. Yeah, married for six months, but it didn't work Got out. fingered up Machu Picchu. <laughs> It wasn't just what they were saying that I couldn't relate to, it was the way they were saying it. There weren't many people with northern accents or many regional accents at all. As I nervously conversed, I heard my own voice changing, like the protagonist at the midpoint of a modern take on the Pygmalion story. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes, yes, I'm from Leeds. Uh, I did not go on a gap year, I actually spent my summer in employment at popular international uh, restaurant franchise Pizza Hut and spent my free time smoking low-grade cannabis and feeling uncertain about the future. I was in Kerala. It was so life-changing. Not as life-changing as Peru, but still pretty life-changing. What if everybody was like this? What if everybody had been to private school and done three gap years and had a name like a child who Dennis the Menace would instruct his dog to bite? Sure, these people were kind of friendly, albeit in a slightly superior way, but what if I never made any real friends? Hey man, I'm Aftab. Uh, hey, uh, Liam. Where are you from? Leeds. Awesome city. My brother's at uni there. Sick nightlife. I've never really enjoyed it that much. Oh, that's classic to be down in your hometown. I'm from London and people from other places are like, Mate, London's the best city in the world. And I'm just like, yeah, it's got a few chicken chops, but not much else. <laughs> this event's a bit awkward, eh? Yeah, yes. I'm just getting straight to the point with people, telling them what I'm about, and if they want to be my mate, that's good, and if they don't, they don't. Like how? I'll show you. My name's Aftab, and I like football about 50% as much as I did when I was a kid, which is still basically a religious amount. Me too! I like indie music, but I'm also trying to get into electro and new rave. Me too! And when I'm feeling stressed out, I like to drink a big coffee and play chess with an old episode of Poirot on in the background, wearing just my vest and pants. Me too? Uh, no, I don't do that one. Still, two out of three ain't bad. So there you have it. My very first uni mate. Out of the blocks, Aftab proved a considerate friend, asking me a few days into Freshers' Week... So, how are you feeling about your first essay? Well, I've got to write about displacement in Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. Right. But I don't know how to do it. Like, at A-level, the essay questions were longer, like, to what extent is Macbeth a tyrant? And you spend 500 words saying he is a tyrant, and 500 saying he isn't, and then 500 saying to an extent he is, and to an extent he isn't, and if you do anything else, you fail. But with this, I just don't know where to begin. Hmm, might be time for a semi-naked coffee Poirot Vesti chess sesh. Uh, nah, you're all right. The main problem was that I was too distracted by the social dimension of student life to concentrate on studying. And the impression you might get here is that Aftab was my only friend, which wasn't true. I made other friends around this time, but none too firmly. I saw pretty people disappear like smoke, new friends arrived, new friends disappeared. But if I wanted him, Aftab, honey baby, he was there. But even though I had Aftab and a few other semi-fictional pals, I hope you're sitting down at this point because I have to tell you something quite weird. There were lots of people around, but that just made me feel all the more lonely. I'll give you a few seconds to recover from that absolute mental screwball of a presumably very new idea to you. Though still, of course, there was Portia Barnes, the woman I would marry. I hadn't spoken to her that much since that first day, but she always smiled at me and greeted me as she passed in the corridor or the dining hall, though she was always with someone else and, and looked too charged with happy purpose to say much to me beyond... Hey, babe, gotta run. Let's go for a drinky soon, yeah? The chance would only come, though, in some public space, in front of other people. And I feared other people. Because I feared, they did not like me. A dislike founded, I now realise, on the fact that I was, at the age of 18 and a half, an unreconstituted bellend. Remembering now some of the things I did and said back then during those initial interactions with my fellow students make me want to roofie my long-term memory entirely away. Things like this. But, like, climate change isn't completely proven. You know, there's a theory that gay men are gay because they didn't have strong father figures growing up. Like, a lot of feminism, I think, is just showing off about getting male attention. 
My favourite film is Pulp Fiction. Do you want to come back to my room? I've got a bottle of Dooley's. Uh, piss off. As fresh as week reached at Zenith, so too did my anger. If these people wouldn't receive me as a happy, chilled-out intellectual, then I would shitting well show the bastards that I was one. And so, I got into a fight on the Freshers' pub crawl, starting on a bunch of rugby lads for the crime, I suppose, of being taller than me. The playing fields of Eton hadn't equipped them for my fighting style, i.e. mostly to stand still with my arms outstretched, screaming. Let's go then, you fat silver spoon-sucking posh boys! But apparently they were unperturbed and Aftab was forced to drag me away to safety. As he did so, one of them shouted, Jab night is on Saturday, mate! So that was it. If this one drunken stranger was to be believed, my crisis came down to the fact that people saw me as a chav. A word I now censure, of course, but one that at the time I did not want to be associated with. So how to shake off the label? Well, what characterised a chav? Spitting, smoking, drinking, swearing and wearing garish label-ridden casual clothing. The former four pastimes I was not prepared to give up. So, it was time for an identity overhaul, starting with a visit to Top Man. And ending with that. At this stage, I literally had no idea how I might grow or change as a person, other than to buy some modish mid-range fashion items. Spending some time contemplating my ignorant opinions and general socio-political outlook did not cross my mind. In my new garbs, a cardigan with fake collar and sleeves, skinny black jeans and white plimp soles, I looked like a character who provided comic relief in Hollyoaks for seven months before being killed in a car crash and seemingly given no funeral. My purchases, shockingly, didn't bestow an instant upswing in my mood or social fortunes, so a few weeks into term, I was still lonely, smoking 46 a day, unable to sleep, and lying in bed all night listening to the Harry Potter audiobooks. I was in a bad way. On the second Friday of term, I was in the library, failing to make any progress with my Waiting for Godot essay, which was due for submission on the Monday morning. The Oxford English Dictionary defines displacement as... Oh, this is terrible. I'm never going to finish the essay. I'm going to get kicked out in the second week. Why can't I concentrate? And why do I always whisper to myself when I'm anxious? Then I saw Portia, Portia Barnes, and another girl pass by at the other side of the library. Portia noticed me, but I think perhaps didn't notice me notice her. She seemed to point me out to her friend, and they both giggled occasioning the dusty old librarian to do her catchphrase. Shh, shut the fuck up, you loud bastards. Unprofessional for a librarian to say that, I am H.O. Convinced that Portia was saying approving and perhaps even salacious things about me, I decided to casually follow them to the coffee machines and hid round the corner to listen in. <sighs> he looks like he just went into Top Man and just picked the first five items off the sale rack. This was literally the case. I heard he's, like, really regressive, like, really ignorant and chavvy. Mm, yeah, he's all right, really. He lives on my corridor. Mm. He's just sad and angry because he's from the north. Babe, you are so open-minded. Thank you, babe. It's OK, babe. So she didn't fancy me. She pitied me. I stood, frozen in disappointment. <gasps> Liam, were you spying on us? <laughs> Creep. So she would not be my wife after all. I'd gotten that completely wrong. Hey, man. Uh, hey, Aftab. Um, do you want to go for a beer? Uh, I want to talk to you about something. Oh, I can't tonight, mate. I'm at a poor squash for the Improvised Architecture Society. Everything all right? Yeah. No worries. It's just, um... Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll catch up with you soon, yeah? All right, big man. See you later. Liam, love, what are you doing here? What a nice surprise. Oh, wait, is it a nice surprise? I, you haven't been kicked out, have you? Because they finally realised you just weren't up to it academically. What? No, I'm just here for a visit. So, are you enjoying Cambridge? Yeah, yeah, it's OK. Only OK? Yes! I don't want to talk about it right now. All right, love. How long are you visiting for? Just the weekend? Not sure yet. For I suspected ever. Well, we're just settling in to watch a fairly unexciting film of some artistic worth that is too anodyne to be truly interesting, if you want to join us. Nah, I'm going out. Maybe Leeds wasn't so bad. 
With its satanic chimneys and sepulchral arches, the city gives solace to its often browbeaten inhabitants and instills in them a hard-headed pride. Something was kindling here in the true capital of the north. I was glad to be back. Hey up, lads. Hey up. How did I know this is where you'd be? Because you texted us about eight times, checking we'd be here. Yeah, I know, Ralph. I, I, I was just joking. So, you, are you not surprised to see me? Why'd we be surprised? Well, because I'm at uni now. So I just thought I'd pop back up for the weekend, give you lads a little surprise. All right, uni, yeah. Forgot about that. Well, uh, how could you forget? Where did you think I'd been? Well, it's only been a couple of weeks, hasn't it? Just thought you were ill or skint or something. No, 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 I, I, I've been at uni. Right. Yeah, it's been good. Yeah. Different world down there. Right. So what's the plan for tonight? Same thing we do every Friday. Go into Leeds, get pissed, sing Don't Love back in anger, come home. Buzzing. Sick, yeah. Yeah, I'm up for a big one, me. It's going to be a good night. That were a fucking shit night. Shut up, Cranny. Well, you lads are a barrel of laughs, aren't you? Don't know why I bother coming up. Well, if we're not good enough for you, maybe you should have stayed in bloody Oxford. Cambridge. And I was just joking. Bet you got some nice posh mates up there, ain't you? Talk about books and sucking each other's dicks. Uh, didn't fully follow that. But they're not posh, actually. Bet they are. Bet they're all called Timothy and Mr. Aloysius and Dr. Javago and shit. No, they're not. What they called then? Well, my best mate's called Aftab. Aftab? Well, like a packet. The taxi driver was a gentleman apparently of South Asian descent, and you might find it shocking that Ralph would use this word in his presence, and equally shocking that he wouldn't react. But for most Asian taxi drivers in a city like Leeds, this kind of abuse from drunk groups of weekend boozers is, or at least was then, a horribly commonplace part of the job that they can't risk standing up to. Don't say that. What, Packy? Yeah. Got a problem with it now, have you? Now you're a student, you're all PC gone mad. I always had a problem with it. Nah, you just think you're better than us. I have a problem with it too, to be honest, Ralph. Shut up, Cranny! Just drop his ear, please, mate. Ralph stumbled off to his angry bed, leaving Cranny and me to walk the other way. So how are you finding uni, then? Pretty tough, to be honest. I just don't fit in there, you know. The work's too hard. I'm thinking of moving back. You jerking? After a night like this? I know. I just can't imagine ever settling in. You know... Sometimes, when I'm preparing a golf green, the grass just won't grow evenly. But give it a little while and the right amount of water and nutrients and usually comes good. So you're a golf greenkeeper already? No point hanging around once the career software's made a decision. It knows what I'm meant to do. Sure. Thanks for the advice. When I got home, I did a strange thing. I did not settle in to watch Babe Station on mute. I sat down and did my Beckett essay. Somehow the week's events were all strangely conducive to writing about displacement in one of the most philosophically bleak plays ever written. Displacement requires having once belonged in a place. Existence is a continual process of estrangement. Vladimir and Estragon embody all human impotence. Life is very bad. On the Sunday evening, I stepped off the train in Cambridge. Just as the city's collective light began hewing the gloaming sky, the cranes around Hills Road were still and dark and ambulances went silently by. A woman of about 20 cycled past me on a bridge, her basket full of books, and she seemed old to me then, like mature, grown up, fortified with adult purpose. Around the fens, birds would be nesting, a night air rippling on the wide water's surface. Beyond the county, across the country, everything I trusted was fine. Though even then, deep down, I knew that was dumb. I felt more steel somehow to face another night alone in my college room. But when I got there, I found Aftab outside. Where have you been, man? I've been knocking all weekend. Well, all weekend? Non-stop? Yeah, yeah, well, I had some water and piss breaks. <laughs> Went for a quick wank at one point, but otherwise, yeah, pretty constant. <laughs> well, I hope you washed your hands. Actually, you knock with your knuckles, don't you? So I suppose it's not... Not too much. Yeah, but I do, in fact, work with my knuckles as well. Oh, right. Yeah, and I didn't wash my hands either. Oh, no, shit. I'm going to have to get that door cleaned. That is a headache for me. (laughs) 
So where have you been? Um, I just went home for a few days. People have been asking after you. Portia said you guys had some kind of awkward argument. She wanted to apologise. Oh, OK. Um, well, I- I'll find her tomorrow. So, how do you fancy a bit of chess, coffee and Poirot? I don't fancy that at all, but maybe we could just go for a pint? I'll settle for that. I'll be sticking around till the season's turning. Ladhood was written and performed by Liam Williams and starred Paul Copley, Sally Grace, Kieran Hodgson, Freya Parker, Paul G. Raymond, Al Roberts and Emma Silly. The script editor was Darren Johnson, the producer was Joe Nunnery and it was a BBC Studios production. That was the very brilliant Liam Williams' Ladhood. And Liam is still here with me in the studio. Thank you for staying with us and not leaving once we started playing the show. Yeah, we just listened to the whole thing. Yeah, it was great, wasn't it? I thought so. It's a bit awkward listening to it with you. I was laughing a lot there. (laughs) You were laughing quite a lot. I'm sorry about that. (laughs) It's okay. Um, Liam, I really love the show and I love the first series as well about your adolescence. The character of Liam does seem quite pessimistic, I think, in the show, the character of Liam. Um, But he always seems to sort of in the end, be okay. Do you think you're actually more optimistic than perhaps your tone suggests? Um, Well, I think a thing, getting quite pretentious, a thing about comedy, say, that makes it distinct from tragedy is that things kind of work out okay one way or another. I think it's important for a comedy show for there to be an optimistic strain to it. In real life, I think I was pretty pessimistic for... Like, it's a hard... Your teenage years are hard and... I'm 29 now. I've realised your 20s are really hard as well. Yeah. Like I'm sort of, warning you, 30s are pretty crap as well. Are they? Because <laughs> someone told me 30s are better, but maybe they were trying no, to it's cheer just, me up. I think what happens is like all your worries in your teenage years, when you're 20, you've dealt with them and then new worries appear. And the same in your 30s. Like, I feel mm. like the worries I had in my 20s, yeah. I don't worry about them anymore. Right. But now there's just new things. Okay. Which I'm sure you just that's what you spend the decade fixing is those worries. Yeah, and then some more problems. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> then like you get 40 and your knees start working or something. Okay, yeah. so no, I'm not optimistic <laughs> in that case. Um, Because obviously in the show, it's a big thing that you went to Cambridge and it wasn't, you were with people who weren't from your background and your school experience. Do you think that Cambridge has been a massive influence on how you've ended up? I think so, yeah. It meant um, my life went in a completely different direction. I'm pretty sure I would have gone to, well, I would have gone to a different university and I'm sure I had a a good time there. Um, But like I don't go home all that much anymore and see my old friends and stuff. But when I do, there's a sense that, there's a bit of distance between us now, not yeah. just geographical, but uh, in a more abstract sense. Like, I still like to chat to people and we get on, but the, and it's quite banterous, but they sort of think I've, I've changed. I've yeah. kind of, uh, I don't know, become a, dif- a different person. Better than you ought, that's what my East End family would say. Ought? Yeah, better than you ought. It's like, you think you're better than no you idea are. What was, better than you ought. <laughs> better than you ought. Like, better than you ought to be. Yeah, I guess like... What would you say in the North? You'd yeah. be like... He's, he's full of him. Do you know what? I can't remember the, <laughs> you can't even the remember dialect. The so that's what, I remember oh, someone Liam. at school, even before I went to Cambridge, saying, you think you're all that and a bag of chips. <laughs> that would probably be the expression. Do you think you're all that and a bag of chips? Um, um, it's a tough question. It is a tough question. Is it? I don't know what it means. Yeah, that's, you know, that's fair enough. <laughs> what does it mean? It's good to have self-esteem. Um, I really love the structure of the show. I love the monologues and the the sketches coming in and out. Was it your idea for the structure of the show? Were there other people involved? Because I think it works very well on radio. I've done a few things with that format now. Mm. I I really like that format. I don't know what it is. I think it's just like it keeps your brain as a listener and as a writer, keeps your brain interested because you're going into two different yeah. f- modes of storytelling I think for comedy as well it allows I really like that it allows the character of Liam to reflect on things and then for us to hear him being an idiot yeah you <laughs> like, get to sort of see the the gaps in his self-awareness yeah. and reality yeah the bit that really made me laugh when you were saying the things you've the things you regret saying oh, yeah. those things at uni what was the thing you said about being I think feminism is like I'm oh <laughs> feminism is just about male attention women so. showing off about male attention which <laughs> Honestly, is a thing I sort of thought. I was at uni as, at the same time as um, Laura Bates, who started the Everyday Sexism Project. Yes. And yeah. that was, I th- like, I think is a great thing. And I think it was a quite influential thing for a lot of young women or young feminists. Um, but at the time, like, it seemed to be based, like, in my really narrow view, like, viewpoint, it seemed to be like, 
Oh, she's just complaining about men paying her nice compliments <laughs> in the street. She's just complaining about men coming up to her and shouting nice compliments in her just, face. They're saying nice things. They're just so saying nice, wrong? sexually aggressive things yeah. to her in public. Um, yeah, I definitely had a, a pretty unreconstituted worldview when I turned up at university and um, took me a while to, to, I don't know, think about, just think about things a bit more. Well, that's, the joy. that's the joy of university. Yeah. <laughs> you can have these yeah. awful opinions and then at the end of it, hopefully, hopefully they've changed. Well, not necessarily. You still feel like that about feminism. Oh, I, I, yeah, I do, even more strongly. <laughs> on that note, Liam, <laughs> thank you so much for coming in. You can listen to the rest of Ladhood on iPlayer Radio and we thoroughly recommend that you do. Thank you. That's it for this week's Nostalgic Comedy of the Week podcast. Use the hashing tag Comedy of the Week to spread the word. Until next time, remember, it always gets better. Bye!